welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today, we are privileged to have with us three amazing, stellar individuals here in Miami live for the IdeaGen Global Summit, together with The Living Fuel. I'd like to start by asking you, BJ Moore, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, so I'm BJ Moore, I'm with Providence. Uh, Providence is one of the largest health systems here in the United States. I'm the Chief Information Officer and also responsible for real estate strategy and operations. And also started at Microsoft at uh, three years old. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, I started at Microsoft in 1992. I was with Microsoft for 27 years and then joined Providence five years ago, helping with the digital transformation of healthcare. Thank you, BJ. Thanks for joining doing to transform healthcare. Albert. Uh, so I'm Albert Monero, and I'm the executive director of Limitless Solutions at the University of Central Florida. And we're a research facility that's working on bionic limbs for children at no cost to their families. I'm Elizabeth Dale. I'm currently with Startup Health, and I spent the previous 20 years, in fact, my entire career in mission-based organizations and realized that no money, no mission, and decided that I wanted to embark upon a career um, as a fundraiser and on that journey developed that art and worked at UMass Amherst, um, Drexel University, where we shared a very dear friend, um, may rest in peace, Dr. Constantine Papadakis, and then spent nine years at the Jefferson Health System, um, transitioning to Startup Health, a mission-based company that for the last 13 years helped launch 500 early stage healthcare startups. Incredible, incredible, thank you for that. I'd like to start uh, by asking you, Albert, you know, I've had the privilege, the honor, the awe-inspiring you know, sort of experience of seeing the bionic arm that you brought into the United Nations during one of our summits. I, I mean, there's no words that can describe what it feels like to see this um, in person when you then juxtapose upon it what it means. A child who has lost a limb can now function. It's profound. So I'd like to hear what's happening. What's the latest at Limitless? And so at Limitless, we've been really focused on being able to take what we're doing in our current clinical trials and then look towards the scale of the program. And so in the clinical trial phase, we're working kind of at with like 20 patients at a time, hospitals kind of around the country. And the current one is in Orlando uh, after we wrapped up the, the previous one in Portland, Oregon. And it's been really exciting to see the technology progress. So our, our team has been working to uh, make it stronger and more robust, more playground ready for the kids. And so we've been going through this transition from going from the rapid prototyping stage with a lot of 3D printed parts to now a more injection molded and traditional manufacturing and the umbrella term just being advanced manufacturing as we're trying to build something that's lighter and more effective in terms of the, the strength and dexterity, but also at a cost point where we can continue to have them donated at no cost to families. It's just incredible. Thank you for all you're doing. I know it's a, it's, it's a passion project and it's a change, changing lives project, right? Um, we, we've absolutely loved it. And it's been incredible to watch the kids are, the kids are growing up as fast as the technology is growing up. And it's been a really beautiful thing. And you have a partnership with Disney now too, right? We were very fortunate to be named a Disney, one of Disney's grantees for this year. And they're helping support kind of our R and D internships for Fantastic. university students. That is amazing. I'd like to ask, in leading digital transformation at Providence, BJ, I know that you, you're one of the few people that can say they've worked for all three CEOs of Microsoft, right? Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, and current CEO Satya Nadella directly. What is the digital transformation looking like? We've had a lot of conversations. I know AI is taking over every conversation. A lot of people don't know what's happening, but tell us, give us a snapshot into what I mean, there's healthcare is ripe yeah, is. for transformation. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I was at Microsoft for 27 years, absolutely fantastic company, great experience, recognized five years ago, I could be part of something bigger in, in the healthcare transformation. And I'd like to say five years ago, I knew this thing called, you know, uh, AI was coming. Um, and um, but I knew there, there had to be some things that happened in the healthcare front. So I joined Providence five years ago been dabbling with artificial intelligence, making good progress. 
but this this new you know large language models um, are going to transform the way we we deliver healthcare. So a simple example at Providence, we're not just talking about it. We've we've implemented these new AI technologies. An example is um, doctors are inundated with uh, messages within their inbox, and our doctors take about three and a half days to get through a message, and it's first in, first out. And a message could be, I need a prescription or a you know, refill, which isn't that critical, but it could be some adverse event. And unfortunately, the way our doctors would go through it, it may take three and a half days to get to it. With this new um, piece of artificial intelligence uh, capability, we now triage that inbox for our physicians. And we put the highest value messages in front of our physicians. So a real example, we had a patient that was having suicidal ideation and they put that in their message. Normally that would have taken three and a half days. It could have been catastrophic. Instead, the AI put that message at the top of the physician's mental box, was able to reach out to that patient, was able to intervene and, and have a good outcome. So AI is fantastic. It's gonna transform uh, the way we deliver healthcare worldwide. But I love that at Providence, we're taking very pragmatic steps and implementing it today in a low risk way that's having an impact for our patients and caregivers. Well, it, and, it, and what's amazing is, you know, you're working with, you know, someone like Dr. Rod Hockman, right? It, 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 in every organization, and I think you're the guy that can say it's true, it starts at the top. Yep, absolutely. It's the tone setter. He's, he's giving you license to change the world, in this case, the delivery of healthcare. Yep. And so as we're looking at this, we were at, uh, at Microsoft uh, back in... January of 2020, right, right before the pandemic, yeah. and uh, there was something going around, and there was patient zero was at Providence. Yeah, that came and, into our health system January 20, 2020, and uh, Everett. And, and a lot of the learnings from COVID came from Providence, right? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for all of that. It's incredible to see and to hear from you directly exactly what's happening because thank it's um, it's incredible. As a former executive vice president at Thomas Jefferson University um, Hospital, how do you combine your business acumen and organizational building capabilities and resources, Elizabeth? How do you do this? How are you taking the full landscape and changing the game? George, first I need to talk to BJ about managing my own inbox. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my laptop this morning. <laughs> But um, to get back to your question, George, when when I worked with Dr. Stephen Clasco, I was actually his second hire when he came into Jefferson. And at that point, there were three hospitals and the top line revenue was about one point three billion dollars. And we reimagined the, the health system and um, philanthropy was a huge part of that. And prior to our years together, they, Jefferson was raising about $35 million a year. And when we left, we were raising about $175 million a year. And it was about building a culture of philanthropy. And when I think about my work now at Startup Health, and, and Startup Health's philosophy is based upon, we, we, we call our initiatives moonshots. And not because it's a big goal, but because when man went to the moon, there were 400,000 people involved in that initiative and 20,000 companies. And this intentional collaboration, and that's what a big philanthropic campaign is about, and, and that's what it's about at, at Startup Health, building communities because you can accomplish so much more. And then having insights. When, when we start to build a culture of philanthropy and we start to talk to families, we realize that generosity helps in the healing process. And, and, and we were able to change the mindset amongst the physicians and make them partners and communicate with families and, and patients. And um, our initiatives were collaborative, cooperative, and the work we did in communities was based on listening to what the community needs were. Yeah, and, and we've seen that, you know, front and center, our colleague mutually, uh, Phyllis Farrell, Eli Lilly, and so focused on um, helping to address the scourge of um, 
Alzheimer's. And now Alzheimer's moonshot. Yes. Right? And yes. Uh, boy, do we need a moonshot for Alzheimer's. It's um, it's just affecting so many, you know, I don't have to tell you, but so many people and families, the whole family. And so it's just unbelievable. Thank you for sharing those insights. Albert, in your own words, could you kindly describe for the millions of people that will watch this interview the relationship between the healthcare industry and technology? How, do, how does that all come together? Well, I, I think this is definitely a point where it, it seems to be changing and there seems to be a much higher drive towards incorporating new ways of technology. We've heard it from some of the other panelists talking about whether it's wearables or different like uh, analytics and the uh, the push for like machine learning and uh, large language models. I think that we're at a really exciting time because we're we're trying to figure out what what those advantages are, um, and so some of it's the novelty and it's really exciting because it's changing so fast. Um, but for I think when we zoom in kind of on on what Limitless is doing, we're trying to find different ways of using advanced manufacturing to be able to create things that are really tailored to the individual, and so creating something that we know will work well for them and then they can kind of grow with it because as, as you know, children grow, they grow very quickly. Um, and a prosthetic is what's been kind of similar to them replacing their shoes. So we, you know, trying to work on, on being able to get those, uh, those devices to be able to grow with them as they continue to grow and change. And it's been great. Well, what's also a really incredible idea, Jen's you know, really always been focused on cross sector collaboration. And what I love is the partnership with the university, the partnership now with Disney, the part, all the partnerships that you're focused on, you know, that you can't do it alone. Even Microsoft, can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. And the other dirty little secret is it's all about people. You know, a lot of the conversations that we've had at this summit, we're talking about AI health tech finance. What's profound to me, having done thousands of these interviews, is that people are ultimately the key. Now, AI may change that at some point. <laughs> DJ, we can talk about that offline sometime, but I don't know. No one really knows. Yeah. But for now, at this moment, in history, it's people. And so, Elizabeth, you're working with so many different startups. I mean, my gosh, I mean, changing the world. And now the Alzheimer's moonshot. You know, it takes your breath away when you think about it. A moonshot for Alzheimer's. What are some examples? What are some tangible examples of moonshots that you all have worked on? So we launched our Alzheimer's moonshot just a few weeks ago, and um, Phyllis Barkman Farrell is the chief impact officer for our moonshot. And just to tell you a bit about our moonshot model, it starts with what we call a champion funder, and the Alzheimer's moonshot is funded jointly by Gates Ventures and the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. So we take the, those funds, and we create an impact board and our impact boards uh, consist of philanthropists, industry leaders, scientists, academics, patient representatives, and they come together and they create a scorecard. And from that scorecard, we then recruit a class of fellows um, consisting of both early stage entrepreneurs and we've now expanded to include academic researchers. So folks who are in laboratories that have a concept that could benefit from commercialization. And then we do a call for innovation. Our model was the T1D moonshot. And we had 240 companies apply for um, about 30 spots. And the T1D moonshot was funded by the Helmsley charitable trust. So we have a blueprint that starts with funding and ends with a group of companies and academic founders that are collaborating, cooperating, and working together with our mastery program to take their company and their initiative to full commercialization because so many companies die in this valley yeah. of death and it never benefits the patients. And when we look at the companies, and the passion of the founders. I mean, the the founders have incredible origin stories. It's incredible. And what, what's also incredible is to hear about the folks that are behind this, like Bill Gates. I mean, not a shock, but the fact that we're trying to solve some of these intractable problems 
The other thing is, I think you all agree, a lot of the solutions lie across sectors. Absolutely. Oftentimes, so that's what this is. Uh, these convenings are deliberately cross sector because we've always believed that the solutions lie perhaps one sector over. So it's it's just fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for that because it's um, changing the world. And so as we look at examples of developments and trends in the healthcare industry, and this is an open question, it's a loaded question. Okay. It's a loaded question with AI looming over us all. What do you think is most relevant to the youth of today? Let's start with BJ. What's most relevant to the youth today? Yeah. Well, I, we've delivered healthcare very similarly for hundreds of years, right? It's very episodic, right? You as a patient, you feel bad. I feel bad as a patient. I never go to the doctor. Some people go to the doctor episodically. I think the, the message to kids um, or the youth is healthcare is going to change, right? And that journey begins very early on. And with these advances of, of artificial intelligence and large data models and and what we're going to be able to do as a health system, the way you the youth today manages their health and the life cycle of that health is going to change. Um, and what's great is the youth is, is probably the quickest to embrace technology. And so there's going to be a nice alignment there, right? Mm -hmm. Youth that are already technologically advanced, where we're going with the digital transformation of healthcare and having it be more proactive mm -hmm. and identifying issues and helping to manage your health more proactively. I think there's nice alignment there. Albert. I, I think it's just being ready to adapt to a constant amount of change. And so with each new step, it seems like it's it's accelerating. And so that means being able to interpret the information better, be able to get get wise counsel. So I think it's really important for being able to create kind of those data structures to where you know where you can go for an, an authentic and, a, and an honest opinion. Carl. So if we think about the youth here in America, 20% um, of our children ages 8 to 11 are obese. If you look at 180 co countries in the world, ch children's health in the United States is ranked 39. I came from the great city of Philadelphia, where a third of the children, a third of the children were obese, and a third of the children went to bed hungry. And so I think that this is an opportune time to use technology, AI, political persuasion, the conscience of all of us to pay attention to the health of the youth, because the patterns we set, you know, the studies have proven the patterns you set in childhood become your patterns in young adulthood and adulthood. And I think as, as a country, we need to come together and, and using industry and, and using creativity. And we see it in our startups. It's really exciting that this is our opportune time to um, address these issues of health disparities and the overall poor health of youth in America. Yeah, and shining a big spotlight on these things is critical. Uh, and that's what we do here at IdeaGen is to shine a light, a non-filtered uh, light on all of these issues so that the folks that come together can actually bring the solutions to the table. And that's what we're always talking about, whether it's at Gates Laboratory, Microsoft here, the United Nations across the world, we're always talking about bring the solutions to the table, like what you're doing with the Alzheimer's Moonshot, like what you're doing with uh, the bionic arms uh, that are so necessary and so vital for, for, for kids to thrive. And BJ, what you're doing to transform the entire industry, not just a small task. Yeah. Thank you, George. A small task. I'd like to ask you if you have one example of a partnership or collaboration that you really look to is like the model. This was like why I believe in collaboration. Do you have an example? Like I know there are many, BJ, but what's one? Yeah, so before I, I make this plug, I, I want to make sure it's critical that we've got five, ten really deep partnerships. I'm about to pick Microsoft. You know, I have a bias there, but it's really been a long-term partnership. I joined Providence five years ago. Microsoft has been with me on that journey that entire time, right? It isn't about small transformations. We've been investing for five years incrementally, improving their products, improving Providence's products. 
And it's just a great example of, uh, of the partnership, right? Microsoft brings their technical expertise and their technical tools. Providence brings their clinical expertise, their clinical data, and really that collaboration then uniquely um, allows us to advance healthcare. And, and not just, you know, this is a US, Providence is a US company, but the, the partnership and the advancements we're doing is for all humanity. It's really a worldwide effort. It isn't just about health. Uh, Albert. Yeah, so when you start as a startup at a kitchen table, everything you do has to be a partnership because there, there was no budget, there was no equipment or resources. And so very early on, uh, I had called a representative. I, I found a phone number online for a 3D printer company and I said, hey, our, our university has your printer. Uh, would you be willing to send me a cartridge of printer uh, material so that I can test out this idea? And I'll never forget it because I, I was in a Chick-fil-A parking lot and he was in like a Walmart parking lot. And he's like, okay, Albert, I'm going to send it to you. Email me the address. And that was in 2013. And it's been a 10 year partnership now with that manufacturer, uh, which has turned into our the machines we use for all of our work and, and being able to see the idea come to life. And it, it was really because one, one person at that company was willing to take a chance on a, a random college student who called and got through to his phone. And look at what you've done since that. Great. Changing the world. Wow. Great story. Elizabeth, well, sorry that you have to go after Albert now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Albert reminds me in so many ways of our entrepreneurs. I mean, you're passionate. You, you started with almost no resources and, and you built something that benefits, benefits children and, and, and children who are suffering. Um, so in, in our case, um, we are so grateful to our partnership with the Helmsley Charitable Trust. So David Pansier, who's one of the lead trustees, he believed in us. We went and talked with him about diabetes and launching a diabetes moonshot. And he was really interested in type 1 diabetes. And, and, and he's done several podcasts with us, so he's very public about this. Um, two of his daughters suffer from type 1 diabetes and they've been investing in in research for many decades now focused in type 1 diabetes and we went and talked with him about our vision of the moonshot and they they wrote a five million dollar check and as a result of that we now have the blueprint for all of our other moonshots because we're, we're no longer a company that's focused with limited partnerships and raising funds. We've moved to being a company, we view ourselves as a social enterprise with a social mission, and we're funded by um, foundations and family offices and, and individuals and organizations that align with our mission. But he believed in our vision. All of this was empowered by the confidence that David Pansier and the Helmsley Charitable Trust had in us. You see? So, and all these people have a connection to that and have the passion as well, even the funders, right? Yes. Yeah. So I have a closing question that you're probably not gonna be surprised with, DJ. And it's, uh, it's all about predictions. No one can predict anything. But we have a moment in time and it's a snapshot, you know, like the old school cameras, like, you know, snapshot. It's a snapshot of time we are what I believe after all of these conversations that I'm having in a moment greater than any great moment in human history, including the industrial revolution, the potential therein. What do you predict and how do you predict AI will change the world? Each of you. Yeah. So specifically generative AI to me, I've been in the tech industry for 30 years. This is the single biggest tech advancement I've seen. And if I go back, Further, I think it's still the single biggest uh, technological advance. And it's going to finally allow us to do healthcare at scale. Uh, and 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 that's it, it's really going to be in the data. It's really in these large populations, right? Today, it's always been about an individual. And it, as far as curing somebody, delivering care, it's an individual. But being able to step back and look at 100 million, a billion patient records, finding the correlations, finding you know, the, the early uh, signs of disease or why a drug works or doesn't work or the efficacy of a drug or early detection of, of cancers. 
There's no technology that's come, not even close. And we're just at the tip of the iceberg with uh, this wave of artificial intelligence. And so a year and a half ago, I couldn't have made this prediction. I would have said AI is still hype, but today I can very confidently say AI is gonna change the way we deliver healthcare and change uh, the health outcomes for the better. Albert, oh, that's pretty hard to follow. So it is. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think that we're we're kind of in the next two to five years, we're going to see a lot of AI get used in our daily lives. Some of it will be useful, but a lot of it will, will be there. And I think it's finding where it adds value. So is this driving better outcomes? Is it driving a, a larger scale understanding of our, our of our world? Um, and then as I think it matures, we'll start to see that being able to help with, in, in the case of whether it's device or it's uh, drug development, um, those are the areas where we know that right now the cost to develop something for, for that industry is very high. It takes a long time and it, not everyone is successful because you're, you're trying to do the fundamental science and discovery. And we're hoping that those loops of discovery and implementation become faster and more efficient. And if we can do that, then that really changes the standard of care on a much faster time frame than the current cycles. Incredible. And the final word was, we're sorry. <laughs> So when I when I think about AI personally, I see it enabling us to really focus on what's important and hope that we can figure out what's important. You know, when I was at Jefferson, I had a huge bureaucracy. There were 180 people on the team, and I'm like, there were nine people that were writers, and now there are 13 people on my team. And it's an entrepreneurial enterprise, and it took me a while to transition. But like, with AI, the research capabilities, everything I write, I send out, and it comes back edited, corrected so beautifully. And I think for our entrepreneurs, like it's going to enable entrepreneurship to accelerate because some of the things you spend time on you won't need to spend time on but figuring out what you really should be spending your time on and what the focus should be it will be the challenge it's a force multiplier right i've said in other interviews today with technology one plus one equals only 1.5 right we put more into technology we get back i think this round of ai is a force multiplier one plus one equals five and your entrepreneur example is a great example right that one entrepreneur that used to be one person with AI multiplying their capabilities, they get that force force multiplication. And that's the final world work. It's the final word. BJ Moore, Albert, Elizabeth, thank you so very much. Changing the world here in Miami, Idea Drink Global Summit. Thank you.